All right, we'll give folks another minute or so to connect. Thank you so much for spending some of your Friday with us. Um, we're excited to have this conversation about the S in ESG. All right, we'll give another minute or so. They're still rolling in. Someone can't get in. Hmm. Rebecca, is there a cap on the amount of folks who can attend or no? Uh, I believe it's a 500 person session. Okay. There we go. Okay. Oh, sure. Did it get sorted out, Erica? Yep, she's in. Okay, great. All right, let's go ahead and get started just so we can make the most of the time we have together. Um, I want to invite you all throughout this conversation. If you've got questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I will keep an eye on it and incorporate them into the conversation as best we can um, for the time we have. Um, I am super excited to be here on a Friday afternoon at the Out and Equal Workplace Summit. Um, my name is Kathy Clemens. I use pronouns she, her. Um, I am the Global Head of Leadership and Manager Development here at BlackRock and the Global Co-Chair of the Out and Allies Network. Um, I'm based in the Atlanta Innovation Hub, so welcome y'all. Um, Y'all's been a really convenient uh, alternative to you guys, so we're going to try to stick with that. Um, so um, we're super excited to have you here talking with us about the S in ESG. Um, I'd love to, while the crew is doing their introductions, I'd love to hear from you some of what you're hoping to get out of the conversation today. Uh, we definitely have a plan, but if there are things we can do to steer in one direction or another that makes this a really interesting and valuable conversation, we'd love to do that. Okay, so um, ESG, um, for, I'm assuming you're here because you know what ESG stands for and that that's interesting to you, but just in case it, that's not the case, um, ESG stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance, um, and it's really uh, sustainable investing in general. Um, the way that um, it's sort of evolved over time, governance was sort of the first frontier. Do you have an independent board of directors? Do you have the right controls in place? Then environment became the, the more prevalent one as we started thinking about clean energy, um, renewable energy, looking at carbon footprint, things like that. And the S is sort of like the next frontier. And as we think about our experiences as LGBTQ folk, and um, the S is really important. I know I think a lot about the S when I choose where I spend my dollars um, on a very individual level. And it's um, maybe the hardest to quantify, but uh, potentially the most interesting. I think it's the most interesting. So I'm delighted that um, we have a really uh, diverse group of folks from BlackRock that deal with ESG in different ways um, in their roles. So I'm going to um, have them introduce themselves and talk a little bit, if you would, how you personally engage in conversations about ESG in your role. So Erica, I'd love to start with you. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. And I want to thank everyone for attending. As you said, Friday at four o'clock, maybe a tough spot to fill, but we I see we have a number of folks who are really happy about that. Um, so my name is Erica Sermetta. I go by she, her pronouns. And I've been at the firm coming up on 24 years at BlackRock. And it seems probably like an eternity to many. I found that our length of service is like, you know, going up there closer to six to 10. But yeah, I've been around a long time, but uh, also came out about uh, four and a half years ago as transgender. And, you know, doing a lot with a network has really helped me get to where I am partial part to this role today, which is now director of client engagement for our, basically our global client platform. And I know like some firms out there, yeah, well, yeah, BlackRock you could have different roles. And I'm hoping if anything, you could take away some of the tidbits or actions and items that we all do. And as we speak to that today, 
and maybe hopefully you can go back and implement some of those actions as well if it's going to be useful to you and your client interactions. But part of my role now is really driving our strategy among our internal client facing base, as well as what our clients are doing, right? So there's, there's a really close knit community here and I'll, I'll explain more as we go down. But the, the formation is, of this role has really been part of our strategy. So when you look at the S and we dig into our, our DEI strategy, it sits squarely in an S. So for us, it is the first pillar is our own talent and culture. What are we doing internally? What are we doing to recruit, promote, retain that talent? Uh, I could tell you so many different stories about that, you know, actions and ideas we've done around there too. Um, the next is going to be our second pillar, which is our fiduciary responsibility to our clients. And you're going to hear some of that from Tanya today too, from our investment stewardship. And one of the things is sometimes we don't vote in favor of those boards, those board recommendations, right? Um, the other unique aspect is also trying to be innovative. Our goal is to help everyone have a fruitful financial foundation in the future. Um, and we're trying to create products around that as well, too. And then lastly, our pillar for social is also having a great impact. Um, really happy here, as, as Kathy mentioned, she's head of our Out and Allies Network. I've been a part of that for four years. It's been around almost 14 years now, but it's one of 15 different networks that we have here at the firm, employee resource groups. And I know many of you have those as well too. But the thing is, we've also dedicated monies to help them go out and socially make an impact in the communities that we all live in. I do it here in my Princeton office. I know they do it greatly in New York, Atlanta, and San Francisco, just to name a few. So part of that's like getting that narrative and story and then bring it to life, right? So what ends up happening is inevitably, we've seen a tremendous uptick over the past four years in client inquiries, right? I mean, we go about what happened over the past year and you look for COVID, the social unrest, right? George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, all these things happening in a social, the equity aspect has really risen to the top. And that's that social uh, component. So for us, part of my role is getting on a lot of client calls. They wanna know what actions we're taking. What are we doing to make a difference? Are we doing what we were say we would said we would do in some cases, right? Uh, you know, it could be a new client conversation. Uh, it could be a due diligence uh, questionnaire that they just want to do a client review. And I think, you know, one of the calls I had last week, which was really exciting, was to just help a client help them understand some things and ideas and share ideas, what we can do to help them begin to build their DEI strategy out internally within the firm. That's pretty exciting as work, too. So a lot of that conversation has been happening. Um, we actually formulated this my role uh, because it's been such demand and we had Michelle Gadsden Williams who joined who heads up our DEI initiatives here in the firm. Um, and she can't be all places at all times so I'm going to try to do as many of those calls as possible. Um, but as you can imagine, you know there's there's a definitely a lot of inquiry going on so that's just part of uh, some of the aspects of the role that I'm doing right now and we're going to continue to also educate because I think it's also important. And you're going to find this in your companies as well, too. You know, you may have a set strategy like we do. And I, I sent that link around. You can go to our website on the app inside of that in, uh, Equal. The thing is, sometimes even your employees, you know, and we do a great job promoting internally, but they don't know all the details. So I'm trying to get cadence and consistency across the board on the strategy. So we all talk the same talk. So that's, that's also a part of my role. That was a lot of that was a lot of talking, Kathy. So I'm gonna stop there. All right, Erica. It's all right, Erica. You have a big important role. <laughs> um, so um, Erica mentioned a little bit about uh, investment stewardship. So Tanya, I'd love for you to introduce yourself next um, and tell us a little bit about your role and what that means from an ESG perspective. Sure. Thanks, Kathy, and great to be here. Uh, well, Tanya Levy Odom. I'm a member of the BlackRock Investment Stewardship Team for the Americas. We have a global team. Uh, and we are divided by sector in the US and EMEA and our APAC team, uh, they cover their portfolios by market. And we engage with our portfolio companies on behalf of our clients advocating for sound corporate governance and sustainable business models that can help drive the long-term financial returns that enable our clients to meet their investing goals. 
So we engage with our portfolio companies. I cover the consumer sector um, and I joined the, the firm about two and a half years ago. And prior to that had uh, about four years experience in investor relations and corporate social responsibility and the bulk of my career covering the consumer sector as a fundamental equity analyst. So it's great to look at the sector from this ESG lens as this evolves. Um, and so we're engaging with companies talking about how they are approaching corporate governance and sustainable business models. And we communicate our views and uh, ensure that they understand our expectations. So particularly around diversity, equity, and inclusion at the beginning of this year, we raised our expectations and spoke to companies beyond gender diversity, which we have talked to uh, companies about board composition uh, from a gender lens for the last several years, um, deepening that and broadening that to include other aspects of diversity, whether that's racial and ethnic and uh, racial and ethnic diversity, as well as asking them to disclose their workforce diversity uh, through EEO1 data, as well as their broader narrative around what they're doing from a recruitment and retention and development standpoint across all cohorts, both gender and racial and ethnic diversity. Um, and broadening that, one of our key engagement priorities is company impacts on people. So in addition to the workforce, also asking them about their broader stakeholder base. So in our experience, companies that build strong relationships with their stakeholders are more likely to meet their strategic objectives. Um, and those with poor relationships uh, tend to create adverse impacts that expose a company to legal, regulatory, and operational reputational risks. We've seen a lot of reputational risks <laughs> lately um, and jeopardize their social license to operate. So again, in addition to addressing workforce needs, and expectations, we expect companies to mitigate those adverse impacts to people that could arise from business practices and expose them to other material risks. Um, so I'll pause there, Kathy, and um, welcome to the conversation. Amazing. And for folks who want to learn more about Tanya's group and the investment stewardship uh, work we do, I, I threw a link in the chat. Um, so Gina, um, thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Um, why don't you share with us how you operate in this space. And um, I'd love to hear more about the Atlanta iHub in particular, because we're trying some really cool things down here. Yes, absolutely. And hello, everyone. Gina Haynes here. My pronouns are she, her. Very excited to be here today. I'm bringing all the energy for the Atlanta office, as we intimately call it, the iHub, which is the innovation hub. Um, so I have been with the firm um, a little under two years. Next month will actually be two years and had the esteemed pleasure of also holding the title of employee number 101 in the Atlanta office. It is very important in Atlanta that you know which number employee, employee you were. Um, so all the fun things I've gotten to do thus far um, have enhanced the, the strategy and the social aspect of that ESG. I'm in the legal department, so I don't like to think of myself as a boring lawyer. I like to think of myself as a fun lawyer. Um, and our Aladdin business team, which is our technology team, which is our proprietary software um, that we sell globally um, for our investment models, and also our eFront uh, business as well, which is our private markets technology platform. Um, within that, uh, talk a little bit about just what those products do and um, a little on how I'm involved involved in them, and then get on to the fun stuff with the iHub a little bit. So um, in ESG specifically, some things within the Aladdin business that we're focusing on are Aladdin Climate, um, which is the E, of course, but then let's jump to the, the meat, which is the S. A lot of our vendor management and some of our outside counsel in the legal department um, do not have the representation in a diverse aspect that we would like. So one of the things that we've really focused on in the leadership under Chris Mead, who's our general counsel, was been to uh, let's dive a little deeper. As we're a global form, a global firm and have um, this technology deployed all over the world, we want to see what the composition of the legal departments are. Who are we working alongside? Who are we exercising um, our, our extension of our legal department to for the outside council world? Specifically, what's the composition of women? How many people of color? Um, I can honestly say that, you know, in, um, I cover, as Tanya had mentioned, the Asia Pacific our APAC business as well? Do we have the proper representation that we are you know, negotiating contracts in these different countries? 
we just want to make sure that as a firm, not only does our department look diverse, but the people we work with on the other side of commercial transactions and also our vendors as well. So that's one thing that um, I would say is really, really keen that we're, we get to do every single day and focus on. But the really fun stuff outside of my job is the Atlanta iHub. Um, so one thing that is really interesting that Erica mentioned and Tanya as well is we always say DEI. Now, the Atlanta office is brand new. It's been open uh, almost three years now. And when I first started at the firm, we were calling it D and I. That was our focus. It was diversity and inclusion. Only as recent as last year did we add that E, which is that equity, which I think when you, when you think of social impact, uh, you think of people and you think of relationships. And how I describe it and how all of us do in the iHub is equity is the connector. And so in the iHub, what we're really focusing on is not only the internal equity that everyone is receiving all of the, the necessary resources as an employee within their job, but also focusing on the community and what the community needs for that aspect. So um, everyone in the iHub is, is very involved, not only in the community and their respective representative regions, um, but one thing that we get to do is partner with all of these fabulous organizations, specifically um, in the underrepresented communities within Atlanta to ensure like that that equity is being fleshed out. Um, teaching financial literacy, um, ensuring that we understand um, you know, rights and education. Uh, we even go as far as voting rights. So you know, it's more than just your day-to-day -day job that we focus on. It's bringing that, as everyone always says, your whole self to work, which includes that Atlanta community, which we hope that extends to just the mission and the principles of BlackRock and just exuding that equity. So very you know, excited to be here. I, I want to add one more comment to that, to your hub. It's, it's so unique, the Atlanta iHub. Um, and, and I want to be talking to you Monday on the stand-up. Right. So yes. this, is, this is something that's only unique right now to Atlanta's iHub. I don't know why we don't do it around many of our offices, but I could tell the audience that this is the cheapest thing you could do. <laughs> and, it, and, and really, it is a half hour session. It's speakers for anywhere from three to 10 minutes talking about a timely topic and giving an update on something. And a lot of the times it relates to social. So I'm giving an update on our couple of our pillars. But I mean, you're there, you're in person. I mean, you tell the audience like this is, I mean, this is something anyone could implement and they really do that. I mean, that's something where the topics, I mean, I'm sure they change every week. I'm not there, but if you want to talk about that too, I think it's really unique. Yes, Erica, thank you for bringing that up. You know, when you live the, the lived experience every single day, it's hard to step back a little and remember all the fabulous things that we get to do. Um, so yes, I'm so glad you brought up stand up. Specifically, um, it's a weekly meeting where the it's like a town hall for the entire Atlanta office. Um, every single Monday, um, as Erica said, for 30 minutes and sometimes an hour, depending on the topic, we can either discuss market data, we can discuss current events. Um, as Erica stated, we get to have her as our guest speaker um, who is in a different office outside of Atlanta. So not only do we get these interpersonal relationships that are being built and fostered um, amongst the individuals uh, that are working in the Atlanta office, but we also can just form a culture. And I think that's the another important aspect to, to social is like, what is the culture? Like, what does that look like? And it's a low hanging fruit to say, have everyone in the office come together in a townhome style, everyone's equal, everyone has the same um, footing and be able to offer any type of opinions. We're very active in the chat. I see today that there's a lot of people um, messaging in the chat. I love chat. It's the easiest way to just keep the conversation going. So as people are speaking, um, we have sometimes community partners come in, talk about the impact that we're making externally, which just keeps morale high. I think in the relationship piece, it's really about what do you want to bring yourself to work each day and how can you impact the community at the same time to just create that full loop on that on that ESG model. Yeah, one of the things I love about Atlanta, I just moved down here a couple months ago from New York, is um, the innovation part is not just about our clients and our technology, it's about our firm and our community. So there are 
um, things we're doing around interviewing practices. So best practices to drive equitable outcomes in interviews. We're um, really testing some of these talent and culture things in Atlanta so we can then prove they work at BlackRock and, and then export them out. So Tanya, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, what are some of the conversations you're having about S with these, um, these, these companies in which we're shareholders? How are you talking to them about it? What are they concerned about? What are they thinking about? How is this showing up in your day to day? It's been really interesting, uh, particularly over the last year in a couple of areas. So with the pandemic, definitely a heightened focus on employee health and safety, not only physical well-being, but mental and emotional health. So really leaning into those employee assistance programs or creating new programs um, to really to facilitate you know, resources and pathways for people to cope with um, the issues around the pandemic. And then also for those that had to shift to remote work, what does that future of work look like? You know, we at BlackRock are dealing with our own future of work pilots, um, but also how do you maintain that culture? as you're dealing with you know, either continuing remote work or people coming in and out of that distributed work model, how do you preserve that culture? What new ideas do you create to onboard people into this culture in a remote environment? Um, and then also from a diversity, equity, inclusion perspective uh, with the social unrest that we saw last year, really more companies front footing in terms of their diversity from an employee-based perspective. As uh, Gina talked about diverse suppliers, we're also looking at companies, how they're allocating those funds with their networks and vendor base and uh, their impact on the community. So what we call license to operate, you know, how are companies reflecting their customer base and their communities from a board level and from a workforce level and at all levels, you know, whether that's management versus the lowest tier uh, or entry level points. Uh, we want to see how that's cascading. What does that look like? So I think both of those areas where we talk about uh, health and safety and well-being broadly, and then also in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion across all fronts have been definitely top of the list this year. That makes a lot of sense. That's a lot of what we've been thinking about as well. So um, uh, Erica, I'd love to, like, what are our clients asking about? What do they want to know more about? Go on, unmute myself there, help. Uh, <laughs> it's um, it's quite interesting, and I, and I, I started to gather some detail first off from just RFP teams. Um, and in talking to some of them, we've seen this tremendous uptick. Like I said, this is probably since like I think 2018, we've seen an 80% increase in the number of questions. So, you know, traditionally it's been like, you know, are you using diverse vendors? The vendors has come up actually a number of times in a conversation. I know it's one of the ones we're going to be doing a substantial spend ensuring we actually employ as we move to a new office in, in New York too. But that's that's been at the heart of a lot of conversations. But now, as you heard from Tanya too, it's like, what are you doing around minorities? What are you doing around women? The questions are becoming pretty in depth inside of those questions. Now, in some cases, they're gonna you know, require follow-up conversations. I'm actually doing a, a call next Friday. Again, Friday calls, gotta love them but it, with a very large client to go through or request for information, they're an existing client, they just have some questions around that. So that's going to, how that's going to translate out. Some of the other questions we get can be, it could be different, um, different facets of what you're doing in diversity. So one of them is around recruiting. Like we have recruiting stats on, on our website, but a lot of times they want to know, okay, how are you recruiting? What are you doing differently? Um, you know, for us personally, this has been a big change for us. It's been helped us a lot. It's probably in some folks why they've joined the firm, but you know, we, we actually want um, from a school specific focus to agnostic schools. So schools didn't matter, nor do GPAs, believe it or not, GPA agnostic. So it's actually increased um, our overall like school representation over a hundred different universities. Now we engage in mixed annually. Which is, is, which is quite different than we've done in the past. So sometimes those types of questions can come up in, as far as campus recruiting. A lot of times it's sometimes it's like, how are you, how are you employing your, your employee resource groups? What are you doing with them? And I think that's, you know, that's also fun to talk about too, especially when we say we, we have special grants available. Numerous, all of our networks have done that 
and invest it in the community. So again, Atlanta is a phenomenal job investing in the, re in the local communities, but depending on the charity, you know, and then, and actually I got at my door next uh, Monday, we have vests for vets. So I'll be wearing my vest um, because our veterans network here uh, has gathered and donated for that. So like there are different things that, and they're like, oh, wow, you do something like that. That's pretty interesting. So people just have some of these questions that just want to know all facets of diversity, what you're doing around the topics. And I get to talk about that, which is a fun role. <laughs> and Erica, too, I wanted to um, talk about a little of the recruiting piece that you brought up. Um, that is huge because we're growing our office in Atlanta since we're new to over a thousand people. And yeah. so, you know, moving from that, you know, what do you look like on paper to who are you as a person has been very beneficial um, in creating the talent base in Atlanta specifically. I think, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the phrase that was talked to me, but it's potential over pedigree, right? And I did a lot of recruiting back in the day when I used to come right in a call center. And, you know, if I found a stellar candidate, regardless of their school, if their potential was there, I mean, that's really getting down into what the role is, is what is the potential, the skill sets align? And I think that's what's really important. So it is exciting that we've done that over four years ago now. Yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting to see what's changed over time as we've made some of these um, adjustments in our processes and our tools and sort of our philosophy even in what's, what are we trying to accomplish and what's the best way to do it. Um, so I'd love to remind folks that you can ask questions in the chat. Um, Mike, I see your question. I will get to it. Um, the um, I'd love to have you all just talk a little bit about where you think we're headed. What do you think the future has in store for BlackRock, for our clients, for the companies in which we're shareholders, for our communities? Um, what do you think the future holds for us? Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, specifically because I feel like Atlanta is the future. I feel like what we're creating and actually, you know, I keep saying what we are creating, but what we have already created. So we've already started and there's so much that has already been accomplished. Um, we talked about, uh, Erica talked a little bit about our employee resource groups. And I think that is extremely beneficial because you get to have a, a space where whatever intersectionality that you're a part of, you get to bring that voice and then having the ear of the leadership team, especially because we're still small and we're growing to that large over a thousand person office, you can cultivate the culture. And so I know in the chat, Kathy, your necklace has just been like the VIP individual here right now. As it happens it is just, every year, Kathy, I'm getting jealous. So, <laughs> as it is so fabulous, but I think like your necklace is the epitome of Atlanta right now. So it's every walk of life. It is it, each each color stands for an individual that's coming to work that brings their unique self. But we all work together on a string, and that's exactly what we have cultivated. Um, I think Erica said, you know, there's people who work at BlackRock because of you know their culture, the culture that we've brought, or you know how we got here wasn't just based on the resume. I can tell you right now. If the community aspect and me allowing um, me being able to bring my whole self to work wasn't an aspect of my day to day job in BlackRock, I would not work here. And I have told that out loud on a on a public stage. I've said that to the Atlanta leadership team. But this is the reason why I'm at BlackRock is because not only of that, that S in social in the ESG module like that right there is why I'm here. And, you know, just having the privilege to speak with you guys today about um, not only BlackRock, but I feel like, you know, it's not, this isn't rehearsed. This is something that we really live each day. And so each of our lived experiences in the variety of offices, but, you know, the future is that inclusivity in every thought, in every individual. It's being in a meeting and saying, oh, someone hasn't spoken up. You know, let's ask their opinion. What does that look like? Um, one thing also about the iHub is it's very tech centric. So yes, we may be a Wall Street firm, but there's whiteboards literally everywhere. They're rolling, they have sticky notes all over them that again, look like Kathy's necklace. And it's, it's this agile framework where everyone just wants to get in a room, chat it out, think of how we can get better. And that's on anything, not even just the day-to-day -day work, 
but it's like, hey guys, do we feel comfortable having this individual speak at standup? Or what are our thoughts here? It's it's the it's being able to voice your opinion. And it's just that's what I think the future looks like. The future of work is what every office should strive for. And that BlackRock, I think, has already started on that path. Amazing. Gina, I can't wait to work for you. Okay, Tanya. <laughs> Tanya or Erica, do one of you want to chime in on where you think we're headed and what the future is? Yeah, I just um, wanted to Steph? piggyback on the comment about purpose, because that's one of the areas that we is one of our key engagement priorities, which we call strategy, purpose and financial resilience. And so when we engage with companies, it may be across a variety of our uh, priorities, but that one kind of weaves into everything, right? How it connects to company impacts on people. And to your point, Gina, it's like, if I couldn't have these elements as part of my role and it feeds into what we call one black rock, then this is not a place for you, right? This is not a place where you think you could grow, develop, have a voice. And so when we engage with companies, we're trying to understand, you know, how are you integrating your strategy and your purpose? And how does that feed into what we call financial resilience, so long-term growth and value creation of the company, right? Because if you're not able to retract and attain the best talent to develop the greatest ideas and implement your strategy, kind of what does that value creation look like over time? And we're long-term shareholders, right? We're not quarter to quarter, we're years, decades that we're invested in these companies. So we're trying to understand what's the long-term plan for developing people internally and how does that impact the communities in which you operate and your partners, you know, and how are you monitoring how your partners are treating their people? So when we talk about the relationships and company impacts on people, you know, it's how are you addressing and monitoring the, the suppliers that you're dealing with? And in the event that they're not in, they're consist, not consistent with your code of conduct, you, what steps are you taking to remediate those issues? And where do you draw the line and terminate those relationships um, to ensure that that whole pipeline is healthy? But I just wanted to drop that in. Yeah, I love that, Tanya. I think that there's like there's an ecosystem in which each of our organizations operates in, and like where do you draw the line of your accountability? And I think it's really good that we're we're sort of thinking that through and encouraging the companies in which we invest to also think that through. Um, and I think one thing I'd love to chime in here is um, I've had people in other forums say, you know, BlackRock wants all this data, they want all this disclosure, they want all this information, but what are you doing? And um, I love being able to say the same stuff. We're doing what we're asking the companies that we engage with to do as well. Um, Erica, where do you hope the conversations go with clients? Like as you sort of build out this role, so y'all, Erica moved into this role like couple months ago, maybe two months ago, maybe. Nine weeks. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So brand new role. Um, as you're building out your strategy, where do you hope the conversations with clients go around the S and ESG? Yeah. And I'm going to tie this into, I see a, Chris, a, a question Chris asked here, how to, uh, how resource groups could influence, which is. I was going to go there next. Good job. Well, I'm going to tie them too, because it, it's part of our strategy too. It really influenced part of our strategy. Our, our groups actually did two things. So Tanya's boss, boss, the Sandy boss, who's also co-lead with Michelle Gatson Williams for DEI strategy. And, and of course, many of others, Manish, our head of our human resources, they actually met together, but they all met with us, the employee networks, which was really interesting because listen, I've been around here 23 years. I've never had that type of level of senior engagement, want to know the good and want to know the bad. So they really sat down and, and these were intimate conversations. Um, I know we had it without an allies. Um, they had multiple sessions with certain groups of us and from senior to junior too. You could have been here two years. So part of those employee networks that you're part of, they wanted to find out and hear what it was. Now, the other thing I'll tell you this, we do now, instead of annual uh, quarterly employee opinion survey, just fill that mind today, all right? And it could be about anything. It could be about anything. This is also something you could take back to your firm. We should do an employee opinion survey, sum it up, get the feedback together. But that also tied in and comments in there were also factored in. So theoretically, when Michelle joined, it was six months later, we actually rolled out the strategy. So there's a lot of input coming in from all over. And of course, 
investment stewardship, legal and everywhere. So that's just to, to answer that question, how that tied in, how many of the employee networks contributed to doing that, just so. Now, for me personally, um, I think this is, what, <laughs> this is what really gets me excited. I mean, I came from sales background. That's has been my world, relationship management, sales, um, the ability to help more and more people experience financial well-being, all right, while having great intent and impact having great intent and impact at the same time is really interesting. It lies in our second pillar around building or creating product. So you may say, you know, I, there's a question about data. Data is also going into the factors or product rating ESG based product, but there's a lot, we have a lot of great e product and G based type product, but what we're doing now is something I think, which is interesting to me is being able to take that out there and help deliver what we're doing around new products, right? And, you know, there are questions that may come up. It could be a relationship manager has a client. Maybe they know or do not know. Um, we launched a private equity product that deals, you know, with, you know, minority-led businesses, right? That's, that's a first of its kind. Um, and probably you saw, if you, if you pay attention into the news blogs out there in the financial services land, there was a money market fund that we launched recently that has the ability to invest in the Thurgood Marshall College Savings. So we actually partnered up with numerous other entities. And part of that goes to help send kids to college. So that's like really impactful. So at the same time, you're doing a fiduciary responsibility for your client, but you're also having a social impact. I think what gets me excited about this is like, we're probably gonna see more of this type of creating product going down the line, right? And it may come out of conversations. Some of the product could be created uniquely through client requests. Um, there could be other products in the hopper that we're thinking about how we can have that social impact. So those are just um, some of the things that really get me excited about talking and, and bringing like the best of both worlds, being a responsible fiduciary for a client, but then having that social component at the same time. Erica, I'm so glad you're in your new role. Um, so I think um, one of the things I want to also um, weigh in on the question about how resource groups have or could influence the company ESG strategy. So we've got one very clear example, um, which actually is the lovely Erica Sarameta's uh, doing, which is she advocated for us to have trans-inclusive benefits. So if you are transitioning or you, um, I think it's also for family members, right, Erica? There's like a concierge who can help you navigate all of the different things you need to navigate um, to help um, support you through that transition. So I think part of it is the ERG being able to go to the firm and saying, this is a thing we need. This is a thing our community is gonna find valuable. This is gonna help us recruit, retain, grow, develop, provide better well-being for our community. And there are pathways for the firm to listen. Um, I wasn't even here when that happened, Erica. So I don't know if you want to say anything else. Yeah, about you know, I, I think one of the point with that, it, it also involved our allies. And you talk about employee networks. I remember doing this through families at BlackRock. So we actually went out and did this poll, like what benefits are we missing when we did all that? And I think what, what ended up happening was we realized that we needed to up our game as it relates to in vitro fertilization, adoption, surrogacy, and lo and behold, like dramatically change our numbers upward. So now it, it didn't just benefit al and allies, but our allies as well too, which was really, I think that's where we really got the, the buy in like, wow, we, we actually need to make some changes here. So we really have done a great job with that and proud of the benefits team for doing that. Yeah, and then that drives our own S, right? In our own ESG. Part of um, our first pillar is our culture, our culture. That's what keeps yeah. our people here too. Yeah. Yep. Um, we've got about 20 minutes left. So I'm going to make another pitch. If you've got a question in the back of your head, you're probably not the only person. So go ahead and put it in the chat um, and we will get to it. Um, there's a question about um, how we, um, what BlackRock does with the ESG data that we collect from companies in our portfolio. And so Gina, I wonder if you could start from an Aladdin perspective. I'm guessing there's something there. Um, and then Tanya, if there's anything you want to add in from your perspective, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. So ESG specifically um, is really just a sustainable form of investing, um, if we just put it in the simplest words. So, you know, as we're just going through like what each letter stands for, really it's a module when you're looking at the companies that you're investing in, 
what are their practices? So it's more so like if you have, you know, if you're investing as an individual, what does that look like in terms, you know, what does that look like? So you're selecting, let's say, a stock in a company that um, now has diversity metrics that they're calculating or now has um, environmental portions that they're looking at. And so when you're investing, you get to see what those metrics are. So our Aladdin platform allows investors to go in and see metrics of companies that they're investing in or where their investments are. So if you almost think about like a retirement like pie chart and it says, gosh, you know, here's my goal in my retirement age and, you know, my how far in the future that may be or how close it may be and how much further you have to go. But as we continue to just live our lives, certain things start changing. Gas emissions, we start thinking about diversity. So your investment focus changes because that's how you are as an individual is, is continuing to grow. So one of those things is with the Aladdin um, platform that we have and also our eFront for private markets, um, you're able to see those metrics and it compares different companies as well to see where they're standing and what that looks like. So you can know the depth of your investment. Um, I would also go a little further and say like, this is very easily seen in our ETFs, which are iShares. Um, it's an easy way for individual investors that can go ahead and focus your investment on the ESG metrics. Um, and you can see those benchmarks there is how we calculate it. Um, we'll take those ratings and we'll compare it to other third-party data providers um, that are out there like your Morgan Stanley Corporate International or MSCI as it's known um, and look at the ratings. And you can see as an individual investor or a institutional investor, see exactly where we measure up, um, not only through BlackRock and our funds that we offer in our iShares, but also um, other organizations as well and what that looks like in investment companies. Great, thanks, Gina. Tanya, um, I'd love, Tanya, if you've got anything to add, I'd love to hear it. And we've got some really excellent questions around um, ESG reporting. So um, I'm gonna hit you up for those sure. as well. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, no, so we are very much engaged with our investment teams. Um, so our engagement notes, so after we've had um, a number of engagements with companies, we put those into our internal Aladdin platforms and our portfolio managers have access to those. And so they can look through, you know, different lenses. So they may be looking at a company from a fixed income perspective or an equity perspective, um, but they're using our engagements and conversations with companies as an additional input, as well as proprietary data that we have internally. And so we think that's helpful to have kind of real time insights and conversations about what companies are working on um, so that they can kind of gauge, is this company you know, moving forward with their carbon transition plan? Is this company moving forward in terms of human capital issues? Um, so it's really real time and information they can use. Uh, with respect to reporting, we've uh, been leaning in in terms of SASB and TCFD frameworks for companies to report on those um, you know, to the extent that we can have comparable data and really material information um, for all of those companies. We find that those are most important. TCFD is very helpful because it, the very various pillars of it, the initial focus is governance, right? How is a company governing and overseeing sustainability or ESG internally? How are the board and management team engaging in that conversation? What does that feedback loop look like internally and externally? Are they seeking third-party advice around their carbon transition plan? And then also what's the strategy? How does that plan integrate into the business operations plan? You know, are there different R&D investments that need to be made, different capital allocation decisions based on either your geographical footprint or your assets? You know, what's, what's going to be changing and how might that manifest from a financial reporting standpoint? And then in terms of setting targets and goals, we want to be clear about what does that trajectory look like? It's great that people have 2040 and 2050 goals, um, but we're also looking at that short term and medium term uh, track. You know, what tangibly can we see in terms of progress? Because you may have an aspiration that's, you know, maybe 30 years from now, but there, there are steps and investments that need to be made today in order for those to manifest. And if there are other things that, you know, technologies that haven't manifested yet that are built into that plan, what percentage of that is aspirational and what percentage of that is actually tangible? So we're having really uh, deep conversations around the implementation and usage of those frameworks. Um, and those are what we consider table stakes 
uh, as we kind of really delve into a company's reporting around scope one, two, and three admissions. Um, but I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Um, great. And I put um, SASB and TCFD, I put those in the um, in the chat in case someone's not familiar with the acronyms. Um, it's really interesting watching sustainability reporting um, evolve over time. I think it used to be like very much a marketing and recruiting tool, and it's now becoming like very data metric, like analytical, which I think is only good to have that kind of um, transparency. Um, I'd love to ask answer this question about um, how we're working to improve work-life balance as a Wall Street firm, because that is a big S in ESG. Um, and I can actually talk to that. Um, I've spent most of my last four weeks um, working on helping equip our managers um, to navigate going back to the office. About half of our firm will be back in the office by November 1st, globally. Not in Atlanta, because we have a mask mandate, but that's okay. Um, so we are talking about having increased flexibility. BlackRock used to very much be a, you're in the office five days a week, unless you are like on your way to the ER. Um, and we have learned that that's not really necessary or potentially good. Um, so we are um, going to a future of work hybrid model where uh, work the office is the primary work location and people have flexibility to work from home up to two days a week on average. Um, on, and BlackRock being very analytical, I ran a manager session yesterday and everybody was like, what does on average mean? Is that on average each month, on average each quarter? I'm like, y'all, it's not math. It's just in general, be in the office more than you're not. Um, it was very hard for people to understand. So, um, but one of the things we're talking about is, you know, a number of us, especially if you live in a city like New York or San Francisco, where you've got a really long commute, working from home has been really great. Um, and so we're talking about the ways in which we can be flexible with employees to help them continue to have some of the benefits of being able to work from home more frequently, working remotely more frequently, but still being in the office because we believe the office is where our culture is really um, felt and seen and connected and built. And as we continue to evolve and grow as a firm, um, about a third of our employees have joined BlackRock since the pandemic started last year. Um, we, we really wanna be together. We want people to be together so that they can learn, do that like in the flow of work learning, look over someone's shoulder, overhear a conversation, be pulled ad hoc into something. We think it's really important for our culture, our clients and for people's careers. And Kathy, um, with that, I would also like to announce that, you know, most people think that that's a top down decision, but we use our employee opinion surveys um, to really understand what the employees want for the future of work. And so, you know, for a typical Wall Street firm, you would think that, you know, all the board of directors just get in a room and decide this is what we want it to look like. But instead at BlackRock, one of the amazing things is literally what do the employees want? Let's listen to them. Let's give them what they want. And this honestly was what we voted for, was to have this flex time off and to still have that collaboration in the office. Um, as Kathy stated, like the majority of Atlanta, I'd say over almost 50% have joined during the pandemic if we're going smaller granular numbers in Atlanta. And even then, we're really open to, okay, can we stay home some days? And then others, can we really work in the office? Because we are this microcosm of the firm. So a lot of our managers are in varying countries and different cities and different offices. Um, it's not your, your direct line or, you know, your skip level. So it's a very different way of working that I think a lot of companies are coming, coming to the conclusion that some of their employees want to still be home um, because at lunch they want to go run some errands instead of having to, you know, think like, oh gosh, if my boss doesn't see me at my, at my desk, like there's pressure and I'm not getting my work done. It's very open. It's very fluid. Um, and that's, you know, I know we talked about earlier what the future looks like. I think future of work um, is, is included in that as well. You, you hit the one key word there too, is like the, the flex time off. I think about when I first got into this industry, like you had to be all formal and you had to worry about your, you know, you, you're trying to climb the corporate ladder to get your vacation days off. And then formality went away, business casual, dress down, come to work as you want. And then the big thing a few years back too, was also flexible time off, which was 
take as many days as you need, as long as your manager knows you're getting your work done, which was quite interesting because I'd finally work to get those vacation days. Now I'm like, I'm probably not even using many, but the funny thing part of it is like, yeah, it, it's, it's just depending on employees needs. So I think that was also a mental health and then plus a lot of work around mental health. I must add our, you know, our internal people have done a phenomenal job just with some of the mental health uh, programs and awareness um, and vendors to be brought in to help people with different types of situations. So some other areas as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got another question around um, the performance and like the correlation between ESG and long-term performance on returns. Um, I don't know, uh, Tanya, maybe do you want to take a crack at this one? I'm trying to think which of the three of you will have like the best data to start with. So let's start with Tanya and then anybody else who wants to jump in can. No, sure. I think everyone's got a great uh, perspective on this. Um, but it's really the heart of what we do every day because um, we're really trying to understand how companies are creating this long-term value in the context of our priorities, which cover just about everything. Um, you know, how they're implementing capital, whether that's climate uh, or natural capital is what we call it, um, to all the various inputs that a company might need to actually be productive and operate. Uh, so for us, it's really trying to understand all of these inputs how is your strategy and purpose fit into this? How does you know, your investment in people, whether that's employees or other partners, how are you allocating resources? Um, you know, and how are you incentivizing your executives in tandem with, and does that align with shareholders? Um, so all, all of our engagement priorities, the end goal is how are you creating long-term shareholder value in a responsible and sustainable way. So when we say sustainable, we're not just talking about environment, you know, from a physical standpoint, we're talking about sustainability of returns and financial returns and financial resilience is the way we phrase it. So we measure that over a longer period of time, again, not quarter to quarter. Um, it's really have you thought through from an enterprise risk management perspective, the sustainability and viability of this enterprise to be sure that you have everything that you need in terms of physical tangible inputs and talent and development over time. I, I'll give a different type of answer, um, Kathy. And this is, uh, think about a time you called somewhere or had horrible service. And you wonder, how is this company still in business? And you're wondering if they're really operating at a high level of efficiency, right? I think back to about the early days of cell phones. Remember, WorldCom was around or whatever it was. It was just horrendous. The wait time, the people, it was just they, they went out of business, right? And there, there's a stat I'll quote from it. I use from Deloitte, I use it. And it's like organizations with inclusive cultures are two times as likely to exceed financial targets. So that's got to have something to do with performance, right? And have high performing cultures. Um, and eight times is more to have better achievable outcomes. So when you look at it that way, Good companies have people who take their team, you know, the work seriously. Great companies have teams who take their work personally, or what we like to say that inclusion, that's the emotional ownership. The emo you take your role with emotional ownership. If you're all performing at that level internally, chances are your firm is going to be achieving better part. I mean, that's just one aspect of it, but that's kind of the DEI aspect of it. Great. Yeah, and then go, go ahead, Gina. Yeah, I would just add a little. Um, you know, speaking to to the passion and what that looks like, you know, marrying the two together of, you know, the investment model, the shareholder model, um, you know, kind of comes into the accountability as well. I think that not only do we need or we want external um, companies to provide these numbers and provide these metrics, but we have to believe it ourselves first. And that's what that passion comes from. So our CEO, Larry Fink, has made numerous um, public statements regarding our commitment to sustainable investing and sustainability of our as a module of our employees and what that looks like. Um, but I think it's it's each individual that has to hold him accountable externally, internally, and not just him, but all the way down. Because you know, a CEO may be in the ivory tower. But then you have the worker bees that are beneath that are really trying to make sure that we're we're getting um, you know those those metrics together and um, having the proper performance on a day to day basis and with exuding that same passion. We're not perfect, you know. We're definitely not perfect. We got a lot of work to do, and 
And if you listen to what Larry says, you need to be a student of technology, a student of the markets. You need to be a student of diversity, equity, inclusion, quite honestly, too, because you have to learn things and experiences that you just haven't been able to experience. You didn't grow up in certain communities. So, you know, we've been doing some work around inclusion dialogues and having open and candid discussions around this topic to make sure that people are aware of how other people feel. You learn every day. So, you know, you're going to, you have to be a skilled at learning inclusion as well, too. Yep, exactly. And the other, um, I'll just sort of uh, throw another resource out. Um, I know that there are data sort of backward looking studies at like sustainable investing versus traditional portfolios. Um, George Serafim um, is one of the um, researchers out of Harvard. I'll throw his name in the chat as well. I know he's got a bunch of papers that he's published that show the outperformance of sustainable investing portfolios over traditional investing. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes left. I think um, what I'd love to do, because we actually hit all the questions in the chat, way to go team. Um, I'd love for you all to just um, share like a parting thought. Um, so the crew that joined us, um, all hundred and something people, um, what would you like for them to remember about the S in ESG as we uh, log off in a few minutes? Well, I'll just jump in because uh, we tend to have conversations that people think this is like the softer side of ESG, but there are tangible metrics and things that companies can report that actually impact financial returns over time. So we look at employee turnover, we look at employee engagement, we look at promotion levels and rates. So these are you know, the quantifiable aspects of the S that I think people tend to overlook. So I, I want people to take away that this is not the softer side of ESG. There are actually tangible elements that have financial implications. Now I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, um, and I would just like to add, you know, this has been an amazing conversation, um, first of all, and hopefully everyone has just learned at least a couple of nuggets or gems throughout this entire time. I know I have. One of the parting thoughts I would, I would um, like to, to say is, do your research, like understand where your personal investments are, like understand what your passion is. So not only that you can bring that to work and you can make the ask of senior leaders, or if you are a senior leader, pull your, your office, pull your group, your team, understand where, what they're, what's important to them. What are, where are the gaps? What needs to be filled? And then find an opportunity because there always is one to fill that gap because it's gonna take a collective effort as we're talking about you know, what the future looks like. Each one of us has to take a piece of the pie. We're not gonna be able to do this independently and not everyone's gonna listen. There are gonna be some naysayers. Um, nobody likes change. You know, I think we've all learned during the pandemic that, you know, we sit with ourselves a little bit more and have to figure out what that looks like, um, you know, getting in our own heads, but step out of yourself a little and see what you want the future future of the world to look like. And I think sustainability, especially that S, which is the people and the culture, um, we can all make this, this place better. Yeah, I, I, um, I think about the time I've been involved with our networks. And I just did a, a call earlier on last week with uh, some potential recruits and just talking about part of that. And aside from being involved in networks and mentoring and sponsoring, it's great, but I think it's also important to get those different perspectives. And I go back to what I said earlier, being a student of DEI and being able to learn, right? And learn from maybe things you didn't know. I mean, I got into this role. I knew a lot about the LGBTQ community, but now my horizons are changing as well too and understanding what I need to know and experience how other people feel. I think we wanna steer away from that and we get scared we don't take a chance and we don't engage people because we're afraid to ask those questions, but there are ways to phrase it, right? So there, you, if you're part of an out network or whatever it may be, there are other networks you can join, right? And learn different facets of diversity, right? And have other conversations and welcome people into the mix of a conversation. So for me, you know, whatever I say it is like, I think to me, education is the key to killing ignorance. So that's what's going to help. Amazing. 
Um, thank you all, uh, Gina, Tanya, Erica, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon um, and allowing me to uh, rope you into this conversation. I'm really, really grateful and I, um, I learned a lot as well. Um, thanks to those of you who joined us. Um, it was really great to see you on this Friday afternoon. Um, we hope you have a really good rest of however much of your day is left and a good weekend. Um, and if you're in Atlanta, happy Pride, because our Pride is this weekend, because it's too hot in June. <laughs> so um, <laughs> thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. All right, Appreciate folks, thank you. Coming. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, guys. Bye. All right, gang, I'm going to hang up. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah. This was wonderful. Thanks, Thanks Rebecca. I really appreciate your help. Of Bye course. Time. Take care. <laughs>